Hey, Mr. P here. This is the first of a series of videos that pertain to the idea of evolution. So evolution is one of my favorite topics in biology because it really is foundational to everything we know and understand about the world around us. So um, in this video specifically, we're going to talk evidence for evolution. So we're going to talk what are the pieces of evidence that support the theory um, and why the theory is so widely accepted among members of the scientific community and really members of the non-scientific community. So um, there are holes in the evidence, which is why it's not you know fully supported by everybody. But um, hopefully in this video I can outline a few of the pieces of evidence that really support or paint a, a pretty um, successful picture into kind of what evolution is and and why we believe it to be true. So let's dive in. So first we have to kind of understand what evolution means uh, by a definition standpoint. And so evolution by definition is the process of cumulative change in the heritable characteristics of a population. And so what does that mean? Well, heritable means that the changes that happen within a particular species have to happen genetically. Okay, There is a genetic change within a population of organisms or within a species of organisms and that genetic change happens one generation at a time. So small accumulative changes or small cumulative changes uh, from one generation to the next uh, that allow a species or an organism to become better fit for their particular environment, uh, allow them to reproduce at a higher rate, uh, increase their fitness um, and so those those increased traits or those increased fitness traits or the traits that that increase the fitness for the organism are therefore passed on. And so when you get a accumulation of those passed on traits, um, you get a, a population or a species that evolves over time. And so what you have to understand is that this really does not happen overnight. It is a really slow, often drawn out process. Um, but but species aren't necessarily in the game of life to change drastically overnight. They really just have to stay current in their particular environment, and because the environment doesn't change that often or that quickly, uh, organisms don't have to change that quickly either. And so what does cumulative mean? Cumulative means that the changes kind of compound each other, okay? Not a major impact individually, but when multiple changes happen, the the cumulative or the sum total of all changes can drastically impact the species as a whole. And so we have these small heritable changes that are compounding over time, really drastically changes the species as a whole. And so one thing you need to understand is that individual organisms can't evolve. And so they do not, these changes do not affect one individual. Okay, One individual can adapt to their particular environment and uh, adaptation and evolution kind of have a similar meaning to a lot of people. But evolution by definition is these small changes that are compounding genetically over time that can greatly impact uh, not individuals, but species as a whole uh, evolve. Individual species or individual organisms can adapt and change um, and overcome you know, adversities in their environment, but that's about it. Okay. Over time, if we sum this up, if there is enough change that occurs in a population, uh, again over time, then a new species can arise in a process called speciation. Okay, speciation is, by definition, the origin or the creation of a species often from another species. Okay, so spontaneous generation was an idea that was disproved a long time ago. We know that organisms can't spontaneously appear on the planet. Um, and so the speciation really kind of contradi or not contradicts but counteracts that, that idea as well. And so new species can't uh, just spontaneously appear. These new species uh, arise from the evolution of previous species. And so yes, there are continuously new species that are populating the planet, but these new species aren't dropping out of thin air, so to speak. They are, um, they are being developed over time through the process of evolution um, by the accumulation of these really small genetic changes in a particular species as their 
uh, as their environment changes. This diagram is going to help show us what speciation truly looks like. I know speciation sounds like it's a really drawn out kind of scary word, but it really is just the formation of new species. Asian is process. Specie is a prefix that means species, and so it's a, a process of producing or forming new species. And it really looks like this. You have an original population that is very successful in its population or with, within its environment. Something has to happen in that particular environment, much like, in this case, a geographic barrier. Maybe a new river, okay, an area of floods, and a new river, river um, winds through a particular environment and literally cuts off population A from population B. This was an original population. Okay, these all are members of a particular species. They all can interbreed. They all have access to each other. But because of this geographical barrier, population A was or is kept separate from population B. Now, I know not all geographic barriers are going to separate all species on the planet. Birds can obviously fly over rivers, whereas small rodents, small reptiles, small amphibians maybe couldn't cross it. And so some geographical barriers are going to keep certain species separate, but, you know, not every species separate. If enough time, again, time is progressing, time is always progressing, if enough time passes and species or population A cannot interbreed with population B, and let's say there was a slightly different environment on this side, maybe this side of the population was more timbrous or more woodsy, and this one was more plainsy, they would often uh, change to exploit the, the resources in that particular environment, and if enough time passes, they would become reproductively isolated, which means they, they stay isolated reproductively. Okay? That just means that population A cannot reproduce with population B. Okay? Um, straightforward. Okay, if they are geographically isolated, they cannot uh, physically meet or mingle with each other, then obviously they cannot reproduce with each other. And if enough time passes and they stay reproductively isolated, they will in fact form new species that often resemble um, or don't resemble each other. Okay, species A in this case would possibly resemble our original population because they kind of maybe exploited some of the resources or the majority of the resources that were still here. Notice the same color. However, because B couldn't exploit the same resources that A had access to and they got cut off reproductively, they are going to produce a new species. And so, again, if enough time passes and these two populations um, evolve enough away from each other, okay, diverge from this original phenotype or this original genotype, they will no longer have the ability to reproduce with each other and therefore become distinct new species. Okay? They will look different. They will behave different. Um, they often don't resemble each other at all, but um, are, in fact, two new species that may or may not um, contain a resemblant amount of DNA or DNA that resembles each other. So when we think of speciation, one of the best examples to highlight this idea of speciation or this idea is to look at the Galapagos finches. Adaptive radiation is a, a mechanism by way species often uh, evolve. Okay? All of these media or all of these ground finches, all of these uh, tree finches, and all of these warbler finches all evolved from a single common ancestor. The Galapagos is a chain of islands off of the coast of South America and really is a, a perfect breeding ground, if you will, for the evolution of new species because there are a variety of environments on, a, on different islands. There are um, geographical barriers between islands. Obviously, they are standalone pockets of environment. Um, and so... Birds will and have been for the last several hundred years exploiting resources on each of the islands, and each of the islands offer different resources. And so, therefore, when one common ancestor left the mainland of South America and flew to and inhabited or began inhabiting 
all of the diversity of islands that is or that makes up the Galapagos, they really set in motion this idea of speciation and speciation through adaptive radiation. What this means is many similar but distinct species evolve really rapidly, okay, relatively rapidly when we talk about the entire um, origin of the earth, okay, this happens very rapidly uh, from a single species or from a very small number of species. And it often occurs because there is genetic variation naturally among members of a population and because those small genetic changes can tweak the success rate of that particular individual those individuals that are more fit can uh, often reproduce at a higher rate and those that are less fit are going to die just due to natural causes and those that are more fit that have those small genetic changes that make them uh, or that increases their fitness increases their success rate are going to reproduce and therefore really have a strong influence on what the birds that will ultimately inhabit that island look like okay um, the warbler finches often resemble each other they are very closely related okay we're not going to talk specifics about cladograms which is essentially what this diagram is um, until later in in this topic but you'll notice that there is some distinct beak differences between these groups okay insect eaters often have one shaped beak um, flower and cactus flower eaters often have a different shaped beak seed eaters have a different shaped beak warbler finches have a different shaped beak okay all of these beaks are properly designed as a tool for their particular resource on their particular island um, it just increases their fitness and so continuous variation and gradual diversions are two other concepts that I like to talk about when we talk about speciation continuous variation and gradual divergence is basically showing you that while all of these birds are very closely related genetically there often is uh, distinct phenotypic differences, which means distinct differences uh, in their physical expression of traits, okay, what they physically look like. And so when you look at this gray warbler finch and you compare it to this large ground finch, while they both share a large portion of their DNA and have a common ancestor, neither of them really look like that original common ancestor and originally or, uh, and actually the large ground finch is substantially different than the common ancestor the warbler finch isn't as substantially different but is substantially different from the large ground finch and so as these branches happen and as the branches ultimately work this way and as the branches work this way which are two kind of extremes within this entire cladogram there are extreme differences among the members of the cladogram, even if there is um, common ancestry. Okay, and so the branches of a phylogenetic tree, which is what this is showing, can become spaced so far apart that the species, although once closely related to an original common ancestor, do not physically resemble each other, um, and that's strictly due to this idea of continuous divergence, okay, or continuous variation, because as time progresses these current species are continuously uh, changing uh, as the environment changes and so continuous variation and gradual divergence adaptive radiation are uh, the driving factors for this idea of speciation the production of a new species okay um, evolution doesn't happen by chance there are specific mechanisms that are going to 100 percent lead to evolution and so some of those mechanisms are listed here fossil record animal breeding more of this uh, selective um, human desired selective breeding homologous structure vestigial structures dna evidence and actually observing evolution happening on a small scale and so what do each of these mechanisms mean and how do they lead to uh, evolution as a whole well we can dive into that mechanisms of evolution specifically talking about the fossil record the fossil record is one of the biggest pieces of evidence to support the uh, the idea of evolution or the theory of evolution because it literally is a record of the organisms that are or were on the planet and due to dating you can actually be fairly successful in uh, putting together a timeline of, of not only what the species looked like, what the traits 
are that the species had, uh, but you can also you know put them together in in what species was around when other species were around, or maybe even in the case of like hominoid evolution or human evolution, we can see uh, the small changes that happened over time, and we can kind of date them, and we can put them in chronological order, and so we can, uh, assuming we have um, all the pieces to the puzzle, uh, have a, a pretty substantial uh, a timeline. So fossil record. Fossils are the petrified remains or the, the actual like hardened uh, remains or traces of animals and plants. And so the accumulation of this evidence from these remains and traces give us this entire record of the fossils that were on the planet. Um, life that existed 500 million years ago was obviously vastly different in appearance from life today. I think everybody understands that. When you go to a museum and you look at the dinosaur bones, okay, when everybody hears the term fossil, I think that's the first thing that, that pops in their mind, um, you think of the, the Velociraptor or the T-Rex, right? The large, uh, really popularized dinosaurs. Um, obviously, we don't have anything on the planet today that, that even remotely resembles a T-Rex, but everybody knows what a T-Rex is. Okay, life then was very different than life now. Life before the dinosaurs was very different than it is now and was when the dinosaurs was around, okay, or were around. Um, the planet has changed a lot in the last several hundred million years um, and will continuously change through the next several hundred million years. And I think the reason why the fossil record is such a good piece of evidence to support the evolutionary theory or the, the idea of evolution is that it really can be used to paint a chronological timeline for when and how the organism lived. Okay, uh, We have to do the timeline or we put the timeline together based on some radioactive decay or carbon-14 dating, but we also can use sedimentary rock layers. We know that dirt and sediment is deposited on top of older sediment. And so when we look at rock layers, and those layers often resemble pages in a book, right? The bottom layers are going to be the oldest, and the top layers are going to be the newest. And so if a fossil is found in this layer, it obviously tells us that it was around before fossils that were found in this layer. And these were obviously around before fossils that were found in this layer. But the problem with the fossil record is that there are often gaps, okay? We don't have um, a complete fossil record. We don't have a complete book. It's like taking your favorite book, your favorite novel, and ripping random pages out and putting those together and calling that the story. It would change the story as a whole. Okay, um, the, the work of evolutionary biologists or paleontologists or uh, the people that are working with this fossil record is they're trying to get those missing pages back. They're trying to figure out what the species looked like between these known uh, species or between the known fossils. Okay, these are our known fossils. These are the fossils that we have actually discovered. Um, and part of the the work that is done, or part of the importance of the work that is done, is finding these transitional fossils. Okay, a transitional fossil is a fossil that would be found between these knowns. Okay, let's say that this is known A, this is known B, this is known C. We know that this species was around. We know that this species was around. We know that this species was around. We know what those species look like. We know how they acted. We know what the what the timeline is or the relative age um, that they were, the, the relative year that they were alive, right? But we don't know really how species A got to species B or if species A is related to species B. Well, the discovery of these transitional species like Tiktaalik, and this is one, this is Tiktaalik, this is a, actually a transitional species, the first um, it's the transitional species between what is believed to be uh, a fish and uh, the first tetrapod, meaning uh, a four-legged organism. Okay, This guy uh, is believed to kind of transition uh, a world that was very marine-based, very fish-based, into a world that was very land-based. Okay, He might be the the link between fish living in water and the four-legged organisms, including primates, that uh, that that walked out of the water and onto the planet. Okay, obviously something that isn't proven. It's something that is still kind of very theory at this point. 
but this is a transitional species and so I will link uh, or label this one as like a 0.5 right it's halfway between a and b it has characteristics of species a it also has characteristics of species b and so it naturally kind of transitions a to b but if we could get a 0.55 a transitional species that maybe is more resemblant of b uh, or we find another transitional species that is like a um, 0.25 or so um, maybe we will get um, a greater more reflective more accurate picture of how species a evolved to be species b okay obviously this species is going to be more resemblant of a than b this one is going to be a blending of both a and b this one's going to be more resemblant of b than it is a and so you can uh, fill in this this kind of sparsely populated book with all the necessary pages in order to paint a very accurate page uh, or story of, of life. Okay, What is the, the problem with the fossil record? While the fossil record is a substantial body of evidence to support or highly support the uh, evolutionary theory, there is some problems with it and the main problem is the fact that there are gaps in the fossil record. Okay, A lot of people can't support or fully support or can't um, really in their own mind um, hang on to this idea of evolution mostly because of the gaps in the fossil record. We don't know what we don't know and, uh, and we don't really know what belongs in the gaps. However, um, we also know that fossils can only be produced in a set of very specific circumstances okay the sediment has to cover them quickly the sediment has to quickly harden um, decomp of the actual body has to be halted uh, relatively quickly right decomposition wants to completely digest and break down all of the remains of the organism and if it is not um, sealed correctly within the sedimentary layer it's not going to form a fossil and so not every species on the planet has been fossilized correctly and even if the species has been fossilized correctly we haven't been able to find all the species or all the fossils that are on the planet because we haven't literally dug up the entire planet right that would be terrible we don't want to dig up everything uh, and so therefore just by default we cannot uh, physically find all the fossils so there will be gaps in this fossil record uh, but I think that there is a substantial amount of evidence within this idea of the fossil record that, that fully supports the idea of evolution. Okay, um, So that was the fossil record. We're going to talk about animal breeding. And specifically, I'm talking kind of artificial selection. So we're going to talk in depth on the next video about natural selection um, and artificial selection. But um, animals for human consumption or for human pleasure, in the case of dogs, um, have been artificially selected over time. What does that mean? We have taken on the role of nature and we, for the purpose of us, meaning humans, have selected for traits that make the animal more desirable for us. Okay, This is a picture of a dairy cow and whether you believe it or not or whether you know it or not, dairy cows actually have longer legs um, than other forms of cow, than beef cows than um, Angus cows, okay, stuff like that. Why do dairy cows have longer legs? It's not because um, it makes them a better cow for cow activities, right? It makes the cow easier to hook up to the pumps for milk production, okay? We have purposely, humans, I keep saying we, humans have purposely selected for the milk cows that have the longest legs because naturally they make the job of producing the milk products easier for the humans. The legs, the longer legs don't do anything um, fitness wise for the cow. Okay, Maybe it makes it easier for them to navigate the train, I don't know, but, but the purpose of the cow having longer legs is not, um, it did not originate by nature, it did not originate from the cow itself. The cows produce mutations that were exploited by humans. Naturally, cows had different lengths of legs and humans have always gravitated towards the, the longer legged milk cow because it provided a better milking experience for the human. 
Dogs are another perfect example of artificial selection. We have fundamentally changed the morphology of the wolf. Okay, every single dog that we have on the planet, okay, that you may have at home as a pet, you know, pet Sparky, uh, started and still contains ancestral DNA from the wolf. We can link uh, the origin of every single species of dog back to the wolf. The wolf is the naturally derived form of canine, okay, or the naturally derived form of the dog. Um, you don't see in nature all of these species of dogs, um, and that's by design, right? Uh, natural populations of dogs would not naturally diversify into every single one of these breeds we see today. Humans have chosen the traits that they feel make their life easier for whatever task might be. Um, some dogs have been bred to be hunters. Some dogs have been bred to be protectors. Some dogs have been bred to be lap dogs. Some dogs have been bred to go into holes. Some dogs have been bred to be obedient. Some dogs have been bred to be hypoallergenic, right? All of these things help humans, not necessarily the dog. Um, and so why is this uh, in the category of kind of a mechanism or evidence for evolution, it's showing you that organisms can change either kind of minimally when we talk about just leg length, right? We're not talking about changing the coloration. We're not talking changing body type. We're not talking changing weight. We're literally talking changing appendage length. Um, in the case of dogs, those changes can be substantial. Right? Every single one of these dogs, while has the same kind of general uh, body type of the wolf, um, the, the walking on four legs, right, the, the ears, the face, they do resemble wolf-like creatures more so than like cow-like creatures, but these have different colorations. They have different body um, compositions. Um, they have different weights, different sizes, different heights, different lengths. Um, all of these things are drastically different than the wolf is naturally. Um, and so these changes can be minimal, these changes can be substantial, but they are changes. And if species can change over time, even through a human influence, then that's evidence to support evolution because if humans can artificially change species, then why couldn't nature, through competitive um, kind of competitive selective pressure change organisms as well. I think it does. Homologous structures. Homologous structures is another example of evidence to support evolution because uh, if you really look at the appendages of all of these different groups of, of organisms, including human, you will see the exact same bone makeup in the limb of that particular species. So when we look at the human, we have one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, little tiny um, kind of hand bones, and then we have digits that are elongated that give rise to our hand, right? This is our upper, lower hand or wrist bones, and then digits. If you compare that to a horse, one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, little bones in the wrist, and then basically what has fused from all of our digits into one kind of elongated digit, but the bone structure is the same. Cat, same kind of thing. It has the digits, it has the wrist bones, it has two lower arm bones, and it has an upper arm bone. Even something as different as a bat. Bat wing looks substantially different than a human arm, I get that, but when you look um, anatomically, there is still one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, little tiny wrist bones, and really elongated digits. The reason they have elongated digits is because they have to stretch a membrane between all of those digits to create the actual wing that is, you know, that helps it in its particular environment. Again, even something like a whale that has a flipper um, to use as swim, it still has one upper arm bone, two lower arm bones, the the wrist bones, and then the digits. Now, again, their digits have been uh, fused uh, or, or encompassed within a membrane as well, and so it gives rise to a flipper, but they still have the same morphology that humans have. What does it mean? Homologous structures, the thing I want you to know is that homologous structures means same structure, okay, same structure, different function. 
Every single one of these has a completely different function. Whale uses their arm to swim. A bird uses their arm to fly. A bat uses their arm to fly. But their arm is much different than the bird's. A cat and a horse use their arms to walk on all fours. We don't walk on all fours, but we use our arm to grasp and help us within our environment. All of these things have a similar structure to them, but they all use that same structure in a very different way. Um, same structure, different function. Homologous. Okay, These are all acquired through adaptive radiation. We're going to talk in depth about what adaptive radiation is, but this basically just means that there is or suggests that there is a common ancestor that gave rise to all of these organisms that make up this five-fingered or pinnodactyl organism. All of these organisms within the class that they are in, whether it's bird, uh, mammal, reptile, amphibian, um, are all indicative of this pinnodactyl class, okay, unless it's something that doesn't have four limbs, like snake. Um, but it suggests common ancestry. What is adaptive radiation? Adaptive radiation is the acquisition of various diverse characteristics in a very short amount of time from one ancestral species. This population of finches, again, shows you a diversity of traits, all derived from a single common ancestor um, that was really that was really brought about by a specific niche okay notice that these came about because they eat seeds these came about because they eat cactus flowers these came about because they eat insects these came about because they eat fruit um, all of them exploit a different resource all of them use a different niche within the population and because they use a different resource they had to adapt quickly um, and evolve quickly um, to have the proper tool for the proper job and so they adaptively radiated out from this common ancestral species to all of the diversity that we see today okay all of this idea of homologous structures really leads to this idea of common descent and um, common ancestry uh, which really supports again the evolutionary theory Vestigial structures are much like homologous structures. However, vestigial structures are structures that are present but no longer serve a purpose. An example of a vestigial structure in some of the cetaceans, meaning some of the whales, I'm not talking fish, I'm talking whales, dolphins, porpoises, stuff like that, um, actually have a pelvis or a remnant of a pelvis. Why would an organism that doesn't have hind legs or hind limbs contain a pelvis if the pelvis serves no purpose? And the answer to a lot of evolutionary biologists or a lot of people in the scientific community is that it must have at some point had hind limbs. It doesn't make any, it, it literally has to be that way. If you have remnants of a pelvis, in my opinion, you used to have legs. There are, even on snakes, on the outside and uh, uh, morphology on the inside, if we look anatomically at a snake, snakes don't have hind limbs, but they actually have remnants of hind limbs, kind of like the, the remnants of the pelvis in a cetacean, um, that actually protrude, in some cases, out of the snake's skin or scales um, that are just there. They don't use them for anything. They can't move them. They serve no purpose other than they are just there. That is a vestigial structure and other organisms have vestigial structures too, including humans. Humans have a tailbone. I mean, tailbone is a bone that makes up a tail or articulates as a tail. Humans don't have a tail. I mean, can you imagine putting on pants every day if we had a tail? It's like you'd have to feed the tail through a hole in your pants. It doesn't make any sense. But we have a tailbone. Tailbones are vestigial to humans. What does it mean? Based on the fact that we have a tailbone, it means that we are descendants of ancestors that probably had a tail. Okay? Does it mean we came from a monkey? Absolutely not. We came from a species that was a primate or that resembled a primate based on our DNA evidence that is really closely uh, aligned to the common current forms of primates. Uh, but that uh, 
that species, that ancestral population, must have had a, a tail because we still have a tailbone. Now, the tailbone has been progressively getting smaller. Um, much is the case, uh, or mostly is the case, with all of these vestigial structures over time. If they are not used, they kind of just dwindle away, right? Because they are constantly being kind of selected against, right? Another form of a vestigial structure in humans is appendix and wisdom teeth. Okay, our skull has been changing drastically. Uh, through the process of human evolution and so our skull no longer fits that that last row of molars and and really that's what wisdom teeth is the reason we get them out is because our 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 jaw bones no longer have the room necessary to allow that last molar to come in um, it's vestigial okay um, these vestigial structures most likely performed a useful function in an ancestral organism, which is why we still have them, but um, we, we no longer use them. The reason we have them is because we still possess ancestral DNA, and that DNA still codes for the production of that vestigial structure. We, in ourselves, as humans, still have DNA that codes for the production of an appendix, even though we don't use it. We still have DNA that codes for the production of another molar, which gives rise to the wisdom teeth, which we don't need. We often have to get them taken out. We still have DNA that codes for the production of a tailbone. We don't need it. We could live our life without the tailbone, but we have it because we had ancestral populations or ancestral species that gave rise to um, the DNA that we currently possess. And they had a tailbone, so we still have a reduced tailbone. DNA evidence. DNA evidence now, um, which is really a a, uh, a a more recent discovery. Okay, DNA evidence is is a pretty recent discovery um, that we now can use to to link evolutionary relationships. Okay, the discovery of DNA has actually allowed us to rethink all of these previously put together or previously constructed phylogenetic trees. Most of the phylogenetic trees, like the, the ground finch or the finch, Galapagos finch uh, cladogram I showed you earlier in this presentation, um, were produced solely on physical traits. But now, due to the discovery of DNA, we're going back and we're trying to revise all of those, not based on physical traits, but, but on DNA relationships. Some things that were once previously really um, linked physically have been determined to really not be related at all due to DNA. Okay, DNA evidence and DNA relationships kind of trumps all physical morphology because things can evolve um, due to similar selective pressures that are not at all closely related. Okay, they might resemble each other, they might have the same types of traits, they might have the same uh, lifestyle the same they might exploit the same resources but they are not closely related dna wise and so therefore are not really uh, in our minds anymore closely related at all or share a common ancestry okay um, organisms that are phylogenetically close have a higher degree of dna sequence similarity that just means that those organisms that are the most closely related uh, phenotypically often have the same or, or a high degree of DNA sequence similarity. It means their DNA is, is mostly uh, or is most similar. Genetic fragments such as pseudogenes, okay, which are essex, uh, essentially sections of DNA that are not needed anymore, okay, no longer active, um, they appear at this point to be going un to undergo steady process of degeneration, which basically means that the DNA that we no longer use is in the process of being degenerated, okay, or is in the process of degeneration, it is going away, um, and that is just supporting this cumulative mutation idea of common descent. We are constantly trying to progress as a species. The, the constant progression is, is driving us forward, okay? Um, again, evidence for evolution. DNA is a strong one. And then observable changes. We, in our lifetime, have observed evolution happen on a micro scale. We've even, uh, through the work of Peter and Rosemary Grant on the Galapagos with the finches, have actually seen macroevolution or uh, macroorganisms um, undergoing evolution really quickly due to extreme environmental conditions, which we'll talk about. But um, bacterial resistance uh, and this idea of like bacteria changing and evolving to being less susceptible 
to bacterial sides or antibiotics uh, are examples, uh, observable examples of evolution. Um, how does bacterial resistance work and why is it an example of evolution? It's literally just natural selection. Bacteria are single-celled organisms. They behave just like any organism that is multicellular. Okay, They can still respond to their environment. They still have her heredity. They still pass on their genes or can still pass on their genes to future generations. Right? Um, just because they reproduce asexually doesn't mean that they can't change and mutate randomly just like multicellular organisms um, do on a, on a macro scale. But because there is variation, um, through the use of mutations or through the idea of mutations, um, sometimes, uh, in the case of bacteria, these mutations result in antibiotic resistance. And so in a particular population, a small number of those bacteria cells are going to naturally mutate to have bacteria resistance. Once you subject that population of bacteria to an antibiotic, all of those that are not susceptible okay, are going to live, and those that are susceptible to antibiotics are going to die. So the majority of that population is going to die. However, those that are antibiotic resistant are going to survive because they're not, you know, they're resistant to the antibiotics. Well, when you kill all of them that are susceptible, then they don't, they're not around to pass on their genes or produce more of the susceptible bacteria cells. In fact, you have essentially eliminated the ones that are susceptible to that bacteria, um, but you have left behind those that aren't susceptible to that antibiotic, and those are the bacteria cells that are allowed to reproduce then, and when they come back, they have completely changed the, the susceptibility of that particular population, therefore has changed the morphology of that particular uh, population of bacteria, and then uh, bacteria uh, antibiotics no longer work on that particular bacteria strain and so therefore that strain becomes antibiotic resistant. That is an example of evolution. It is changing the genotype or the the physical expression of the DNA, uh, specifically traits, in a population over time. Okay, We have changed that population over time to become less susceptible to the antibiotic uh, and these are observable changes that we see all the time. It happens in the medical field all the time. They are constantly trying to stay ahead of bacteria evolution. Okay, we we've seen this again. It is a a, a, a specific mechanism or a specific mechanism for evolution, and it really relates to this idea of um, uh, uh, kind of paints a picture of how evolution works. Uh, even on a long scale. Okay, that's where we're going to cut it off. On the next lecture, we're going to talk specifically about the uh, the peppered moth and how natural selection has really played a uh, a role in the production of specific traits. But until then, see ya.